Okay, we will let folks come in <laughs> as they as they come. Um, I want to welcome everyone today. I'm Emily Zilber. I'm the Director of Curatorial Affairs and Strategic Partnerships at the Wharton Eschrick Museum. And I'm so thrilled for you to join us for today's curator conversation with Jennifer Navamilikin, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Um, first, I want to let you know about a few upcoming virtual and in-person programs to have on your calendar, um, September 28th. So next week at noon, we'll have our next Spotlight Talk where we'll highlight the photographer and Eshrick patron, Marjorie Content. This is the first program we'll be doing um, in celebration of daring design, the impact of three women on Wharton Eshrick's craft currently on view at the Missioner Museum. Um, you can also join us for a curator conversation with the exhibition co-curator, Laura Igo on October 14th. So sign up for that. Um, I also want to let you know about a new series of really exciting fundraising events that we're doing titled Creative Passports, which certainly celebrates some of our new archival finds, including Escherich's own passport from the late 20s, early 30s. We'll be having three celebrations in the studio in October and November where over the course of an afternoon, intimate groups of guests will be treated to art making activities, behind the scenes peaks and good conversation to reconnect with Eshrick's creative legacy and to talk more about what's coming up for the museum. So you can find information about the virtual talks, about the fundraising programs, recordings of past programs, all on our website. My colleague who's on the chat today, Katie Wynn, will make sure to, to link to those and you'll receive a follow-up email as well. Um, we also hope that you'll come and visit again once now that we're open to the public. Um, this week we'll be opening a new installation in our visitor center, Story from the Archives, New Discoveries at the Wharton Eshrick Museum. And Roberta Massich, artist in residence, is on view through December. So with all of that good stuff happening at the museum, uh, <laughs> shared and, and, and on your calendar, I hope, I'm really pleased to welcome um, Nava Milliken to the Eshrick Museum today. She is the Artistic Director for the Center for Art in Wood in Philadelphia, where she's responsible for creating and executing the exhibition schedule, facilitating the annual Wingate ITE International Residency Program, maintaining the integrity of the museum collection and research library, and overseeing the center's publishing and documentation activities. So a lot of incredible work there. Um, I am lucky enough to work with her on the collections committee and her knowledge and insight is, is remarkable. Um, today, however, We'll focus on her work as co-curator, along with the artist Silas Kopf of Out of Bounds, The Art of Croquet, which is now on view at the center through October 24th, 2021, an exhibition of artist-made mallets and balls that explores the game and its place in culture and society. And I have to say, it is so fun. I hope that anyone who is local to, to Philadelphia gets a chance to, to come over and see the, the remarkable sort of vision on display in that exhibition. Um, certainly, we hope the case we make today will be <laughs> enticing. So we'll have about half an hour of conversation today. I'll ask folks to mute themselves if they haven't already. Then we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions and conversation at the end. Please feel free to put questions in the chat. Um, Katie is standing by and I will try to answer them as I'm able to. Um, but without further ado, I wanna take it to, to, to Nava. We'll welcome her to WEM's virtual space. Thanks, Emily. This is really fun. I think this is the first time um, I've been a part of um, Escherich Museum programming. So this is a thrill and an honor. Thank you. The, the first time, but certainly not the last. I'm going to I'm going to hold you to that. And <laughs> <laughs> we'll brainstorm some other opportunities. Um, one of the reasons that we really wanted to have you here and I'll and I'll share my screen so that folks can see this. Um, is that we are so excited to have an Escherich print croquet game, um, as well as the woodblock used to produce it as a part of the current exhibition. And I'm showing here one thing that we, we don't have that relates to this are these fantastic 
sketches that Eshrick did um, in preparation for creating the print. And then of course the block that we have in the collection here. Um, Eshrick produced this print based on sketches he did of Sherwood Anderson's family and friends playing croquet at Ripson Farm, the writer's home. He combined images from the 1934 woodcut. Um, these different images were printed in Anderson's newspapers. And I'm really struck by the idea that this print is so centered around community. And so is this exhibition, which asks artists known for their work to create croquet balls and mallets. And so I'm going to show you just a brief sneak peek into um, the space itself. And then, of course, Eshrick's print and block on view um, uh, there. I'm going to stop the stop my screen share now if I can figure out how to do that. Oh, and <laughs> let Nava tell us a little bit more about the exhibition and how it came to be. Sure, Emily, thank you. Um, so it all started back when <laughs> um, Peter Korn, who is the executive director and the founding director of the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship up in Rockport, Maine, um, had pitched this idea to me and asked me to, um, to co-jury a list of woodworkers who might be interested in participating with um, woodworker and furniture artist um, and master marquetry artist Silas Cope, who's based in Northampton, Massachusetts, I think. Um, and so I had known that, that um, croquet matches were an annual um, fixture on the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship uh, annual uh, residency itinerary and um, and I had heard a lot of there's a kind of mythology about how um, how competitive they are and very cutthroat and um, this was a little bit mystifying to me because my background in croquet is very much about me and my tough skins whacking balls around the yard um, as, a, as a little as a little tyke so um, the idea that you could be full grown adults um, getting you know violent with your stratagem in, in the same game with these beautiful, which is for me was very much characterized by these beautiful um, objects that were mm. color coded in primary colors um, uh, was just, I needed to know more about that. And so I spoke extensively with Silas and extensively with Peter uh, about this history and, um, and the, going on, the goings on up in Maine and um, and so it, a long story short, in the, in the course of um, the months, the early months of 2020, uh, we put together a list and we reached out to something 30 or 35 um, artists in our field. And then we, um, we eventually 21 artists decided to take part. And so that's what's in the show. Uh, the brief was very simple, make um, a wooden croquet mallet and coordinating ball. Mm -hmm. And um, and then the display of the exhibition opened in 2020 in September 2020. So what happened unintentionally is that we had a number of artists who who whether intentionally or not were responding more to the events as they unfolded throughout 2020 in real time as they were in their studios, thinking about how they would respond to this game, which seems so arcane, um, especially in that time. Uh, so they used the the accoutrement of the game, um, which which may seem um, kind of patrician and and um, out of beyond our kind of current reality for some, but or um, you know sort of fun and like a backyard pastime for others, a harmless. Um, tame kind of game and um, what we have gathered in the gallery now are um, 21 works that um, if you think about how they speak to 2020 they range from you know the artist working over their the fact of their being isolated in the early parts of the pandemic um, or or estranged from their communities estranged from the materials or the equipment that they would normally use to make um, a turned, uh, a lathe turned mallet and ball, or 
um, they're attacking more traditionally the rules of croquet or the way croquet has appeared throughout pop culture and film, or they're looking at racial injustice um, through in a, in a kind of irony of, of again, this patrician um, leisure class game um, and contrasting it with the, vit the, the sort of vital um, discussions that were taking place um, and continue to take place. Uh, as a result of the death of George Floyd. Hmm. So we've got this incredible range here, and I think it's important. I want to clarify for folks, the, the artists who were invited to produce these mallets and balls were not artists. Were any Had any of them had croquet, mallet, and ball making as a regular part of their, their practice working with wood or sculpture or furniture? I would say that no, by and large, absolutely <laughs> yeah. not. I mean, one of the artists is a luthier. Um, one of most of the artists are furniture makers. Um, and then there are a few, I mean, there are a few artists who are sculpture artists or or kind of bridging the line between installation and furniture. And um, really only Silas himself, who did insert himself into the list. Um, is the is the croquet aficionado out of everyone. Um, the one uniting factor between everyone in the show was that they are all artists who work primarily with wood. And that was the one cat that was the one um, ask of Peter. Hmm. They were this, is, this is making me think we need to do a jury or a juried exhibition theme at the Escherich Museum for croquet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um so so what an incredible opportunity to really see artistic voice um, in a clear way because you have this consistency of, of the form and, and, and this invitation to people to do something that they don't normally do. I'm curious if you, know, you can share a little bit about um, what the most sort of exciting or surprising thing you've learned through, through commissioning these works. Um, has been? Oh, so many things. Um, <laughs> I learned recently, um, we had a we had an opening happy hour on Zoom, um, because the artists are spread out all across the country. So um, doing, doing our opening um, on Zoom made a lot of sense for us. And um, in the course of the evening, I learned that croquet is a billiard sport. And um, that that seemed odd to me, because I think of billiards, when I think of billiards, I think of pool or snooker mm -hmm. and um but no billiards is defined as using a tool a, a sport in which a sport or a game in which a tool is used to move a ball um in competition with an opponent so billiards it is um what else uh there's a lot of trivia um but uh but i yes and i learned i learned some things about the I learned some more information about the um, behavior of some of the players up in the CFC um, matches that maybe are could be unveiled in, at another time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll know that if we ever want to head up to the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship to, to get a game going. <laughs> Not always safe for work. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I'm curious if you can take us through some of the artworks in the exhibition that you feel like really exemplify the sort of potential of asking a practicing woodworker to bring his or her own sensibility to this form. I think this is such an interesting, um, to talk about artistic voice in this way brings it back to Escherich for me in many ways, right? Because Escherich is one of these artists where there is a sensibility, there's an outlook, there's an aesthetic language. And he's somebody who is working across so many different forms and ways of making um, that there's always a new challenge, a new um, perspective that comes from trying on a different kind of, of form to produce. So I'd love to hear a little bit about, about some of the pieces that really, um, really speak to you and continue to as you live with this work in, in, at, at the center. I would be delighted to. Um, but first, Emily, I first I want to um, thank the Wharton Escherick Museum for loaning this amazing and charming work um, for the exhibition. This was not part of the original exhibition, of course. And then um, as the exhibition travels to Fuller Craft Museum next year, I don't anticipate that it will travel with it. That's another discussion. But 
Um, <laughs> if, so, they, if they want to ask us, we can talk about a loan. <laughs> sure. um, they, but it's so it's so gratifying and meaningful for us to include it in, in this exhibition. And I, to tell you the truth, I would not have even reached out um, if I hadn't already been looking at the work of Skip Johnson. Mm -hmm. um, many of you know, Skip Johnson was a Madison, Wisconsin-based woodworker um, who had a very prolific artist who had led the um, University of Wisconsin-Madison's furniture and woodworking department, uh, which is now, it's now one of the leading um, schools, especially for graduate level woodworking in the country. Um, he built it to what it is now. And um, I had learned last year in the course of writing a piece for um, a craft-based magazine in San Diego, um, I had written about croquet in the time of COVID. And um, so I took a, it was a chance to take a closer look at Skip's work. Um, and I'm gonna try to, this might be a little messy, so close your eyes for a moment while I adjust my screen sharing. Um, but I did want to uh, bring out Skip's work a little bit because it does connect to Escherich and in, in, at least in the process of bringing the work to the show. So this is, this is one of the first Skip Johnson croquet sets. He had made at least five sets. We have documentation about five sets that he made in the course of his career between 1983 and 1991. Um, he came from a very competitive croquet playing family. His daughter told me that her grandmother, Skip's mother, used to play one-handed. She took all of her shots one-handed and she needed the free hand for her drink. Uh, and she, uh, she was the master of the course. So um, needless to say, it was very ingrained in their family and in their traditions. So this work, which is um, made out of cherry and oak, was one of the early sets from the early 80s. Um, and it's just an incredible, beautiful piece um, that shows the virtuosity of Skip, but also his, um, his commitment to play. And um, then the other work that is a favorite of mine was the last set that he made, which is completely different. Even in his switching the, you know, here we have everything on the outside um, in the coquetterie, everything's exposed. Here, everything comes enclosed in, in this kind of uh, plywood carapace. Um, everything folds up into a very tidy box on wheels. And, um, and as you can see, it's a really unique, beautifully stylized piece of non, um, kind of nondescript wood type and plywood. And, um, and interestingly enough, this set is still in the care of the family, but it was so enthusiastically played um, among the family that it's kind of beyond conservatorship now. So um, we're, we're unable to restore it uh, to a shape that, that could be brought into the center's collection, for example, or into a show. So uh, that's unfortunate on the one hand, just as an object, but on the other hand, the, the history and the love that it received over the years is kind of um, an antidote to that loss. Um, so I mentioned that because um, thinking about Skip's uh, commitment to this game reminded me that perhaps there would be other collections where, wherein um, artists had made sets. And of course, Beshrick was the first to come to mind because, um, you know, a man who made martini stirs <laughs> could feasibly have made his own croquet sets. Um, so I, I guess we don't know if he made croqueterie or not. But I'm not aware of one, but if anyone out there has, <laughs> has a lead on an Escher croquet set, um, you please get in touch. I'd love to know about it. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm waiting by the phone for that. <laughs> but, um, but uh, you know, it was, a, it was a, I'd rather know. So I wrote a quick note to Emily and Julie and, um, and then completely by surprise, I am sent this image of the most charming thing I've ever seen. So um, I'm very, very happy to include it in our showing. It's, it's so great. I will point out though, that it shows eight players, not six, which is the regulation number of players. So I guess they were doing teams. 
it this. gives you some some um, some attitude about how maybe how seriously they took uh, croquet yeah. at Ripson. Maybe it was a, an all an all players are welcome kind of environment. Yeah. See, that's an observation <laughs> that I would not have made a few months ago. So my game also <laughs> has um, been elevated over these past few months. Um, and we can take that out to the grass. Anyone who wants to challenge that. Uh, <laughs> So, oh, so oh, yes, okay. So that kind of um, that was what I wanted to say about how how Mr. Escherich ended up in the in the show out of bounds. Um, I will also point out that I asked Winter Tour as well if there were any um, examples of croquet in their collection, and I learned about the Duponts that apparently they were not croquet players, decidedly and publicly not fans of croquet. They played badminton, tennis, and golf and probably bocce, those, that was the extent of their lawn sports, but croquet was not played among the DuPonts. And uh, <laughs> leave that there. Um, so as for works in Out of Bounds, um, I did, you know, I mentioned that a lot of artists were, were kind of faced suddenly um, with, with a sense of isolation and, and not having the kind of access to, the tools that they would use to create mallets and balls if they were in their normal surroundings. And um, Katie Hudnell's work is, I think it's called Eye Mallet, is one such piece. Emily, do you have an image of that one? Or? I can I can bring up an image of that if that's if that's easiest. Okay. Um, or you know, I we'll figure it out. <laughs> okay. okay. I mean it's just if you're if you Katie is a um um, um, now she's taken over the department. Oh, I'm so glad I mentioned that. Um, that she's taken over the department in Madison. And um, so there's really nice continuity there that I feel that I need to speak with her about. Um, and I, she had never made a croquet mallet before and, and she was trying, she, oh, per, oh, there, yes. Well, and, ignore, and you, it's on, a, it's on a screen with you. So we'll, we'll, we'll. Yeah. <laughs> Well, ignore the rude lady on the right, but um, Katie had, um, you know, normally she would think this through by saying, okay, so it's round, so it needs to be made on the lathe. I don't do much work on the lathe, but I'll figure this out. Um, and so she ended up carving this and um, because she didn't have access to a lathe. And also it allowed her to, to draw more from her practice um, which is as I would describe her as a sculpture artist who who works within the framework of furniture. And um, but her work is very whimsical, often often very surprising in forms. She uses only salvaged woods, and um, and then she includes she's an incredible drafts person. So she includes her drawings on just about everything she does, whether it's as a kind of painted wallpaper or um, just a touch of her vision of the world um, here and there in inside her works in surprising places. So the eyeball and mallet are um, very much in line with what she's doing now, which is looking at these kind of cyclops or um, from my heritage, the nazao, which is the, the eye that, um, the evil eye, um, and, um, and talismans that protect us from evil. Um, so I, I just, I just love this piece. Um, and she was making it at a time she had to kind of figure out how to transfer all of her curriculum into virtual learning and connecting with her students in her first year in her new position. Um, through the virtual means. And um, there was a lot of upheaval for art instructors at that time because um, you, you generally, much of your teaching has to do with occupying a, a wood sh shop or, um, or a studio. So she, did, she developed about, I think, five different prototypes for the ball and then went with this one. Um, so there was a lot of thinking exercise behind the development of this piece. And certainly that that sort of zoom landscape, thinking about what we can see, when we see it, how we see it, um, that that sort that gives it a little bit of a, a different and, and interesting flavor to to that kind of iconography. Absolutely. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing now. I'd love okay. to hear about um, 
other works that really yes. um, speak to you in, yes. in the exhibition? Um, Amy Forsyth and Beth uh, Ireland. I, I think I'd like to bring up Beth Ireland. I'll try to share Great. an image of Beth Ireland's work. Um, they both looked at the rules of the game and just bear with me while I find where this image is. Um, and if this gives you, if all this clicking gives you vertigo, um, look away. Uh, let's see. <laughs> okay, we're getting closer. Um, here she is. Um, so uh, I have a better image of this in the exhibition, but you'll just have to come and see it. Um, this is called Cross K. And Beth mentioned that she um, had always been really bored with croquet. Um, she thought that the game did not move quickly enough for her. And um, she was looking for a way to kind of zhuzh it up, make it more fast paced and more exciting. So she, she um, combined it and created a hybrid, a new hybridized game called Cross K, which is the um, combination of crossbow and croquet. I am not exactly sure how this might be practically put to use and how the um, arrows uh, slash balls are, are actually propelled through the use of the, um, the bow, but um, she'll have to come and do a demonstration of that uh, for us. But this was, this, so this was one such it's work. So with, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say it's so interesting to me because I think of Beth um, for her musical instruments and and that relationship between string and wooden body is just taken to a totally different place <laughs> in, a, in a work like this. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's I mean, first of all, it's just a beautiful piece to encounter. Um, and second of all, you can admire the craftsmanship um, and the sculptural formal mm -hmm. qualities of it as well. It's very satisfying to look at compositionally because it's just arranged in the way that the croquetterie sets are, are really beautiful objects in and of themselves. And um, which is how I got interested in, in croquet in the first place. It was because these beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful little objects, everything matches up, everything has a partner. And they're arranged beautifully and functionally on this little cart that allows you to take your set anywhere. And um, there, the colors were fantastic and it was just so appealing to me as a child. And I took that with me um, to the present day. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the way Beth has played with that uh, material history of croquet, which doesn't get discussed a lot, um, it was, it's just really satisfying and pleasing. And we've got here um, a piece that also seems to have a whole set <laughs> <laughs> integrated in, into the mallet. Can you tell us a little bit yes. about what we're seeing? Yes, these are, this is for your hardcore players that need provisions when they're out on the green. Uh, this is a work by Amy Forsyth, who is, um, lives in Bechtelsville and um, teaches architecture at um, the university up there. Of course, I'm forgetting the name of the school. Um, but she teaches arch archetype, uh, architecture and sculpture, and um, she's been a resident at the center twice now. She um, has developed uh, a unique, very unique croquetry for the croquet players that need to relax a little bit when they're on the green. Um, it was inspired by the way she had witnessed the most mild mannered people in her life change character when they get on the course and become these aggressive, uh, strategic, um, <laughs> vindictive uh, players, just, just transformed just by the game and the rules and the stratagem of it itself. So um, she wanted people to kind of relax a little bit. So she created this, this set, which has its own beverage holder. It has two sets of rules. Uh, so that, you know, the argument when the arguments inevitably about rules begin, you can refer to your rule book right here in the set itself. It has um, a musical instrument for creating a distraction when your opponent is about to strike. And there are many, many more things. And every time I walk by it, I see something new. This is very Amy. It's very whimsical. Um, the fact that her husband is modeling 
the piece um, and dressed appropriately, um, even though the terrain for the course is here is uh, questionable um, and not regulation. Uh, it is it is a really fun piece. Mm. Um, it also comes with eyewear. Maybe I have a here. OK, here it is an installation. You can see the eyewear that goes with it. Um, breath mints, of course, to um, to mask the quantity of alcohol you've consumed while playing. <laughs> oh, she's thought of everything. It's uh, a it's a Swiss Army croquet set. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and then uh, and then another theme that that surprisingly came through, um, and as a result of the brief here is. Um, is is a response to the racial justice um, protests that that were taking place just as these artists were kind of in the middle of the process of developing these works. So Scott Grove is a furniture maker, um, and this was his. I mean, it's a very. I think it's a very direct uh, response. It's called racial croquet, and you see here. Uh, the deconstructed pieces of a croquet mallet and ball. Here is the mallet. Here's the the shaft of the mallet, and then the ball. And um, this responds directly to um, Derek Chauvin as he's um, killing George Floyd in Minneapolis last year. And um, the title of the work is Eight Minutes Forty Six Seconds, which um, most of us know is the amount of time that. Derek Chauvin had his knee um, suffocating George Floyd. And um, the purchase price is $846. So it's, uh, it's a very direct and provocative response um, mm. that illustrates something very, very um, important but pivotal in 2020. And uh, we'll reflect on this further down the line in our history. Um, another one that I really love visually and as, as an expression of um, racial justice is this work by the luthier Jim McDonald. Uh, it's a work of marquetry and it takes its inspiration from the scene in Do the Right Thing, Spike Lee's movie from 1989, where uh, a character named Radio Rahim gives a long monologue um, explaining his two, he has knuckle rings and explains that uh, one is the brother of love and one is the brother of hate and they have a relationship between them and the tension between them is what keeps all mankind going. So Jim um, took the very a very traditional but very modern form of the croquet mallet, which um, which is more rectangular. They they've abandoned the round form now for a rectangular, um, glued up piece of wood that's not turned but shaped, um, and then may have like a, a sight line. They call it a sight line down down the top so that the player can look kind of receive take guidance from it for for their shot. Mm -hmm. So he's he's kind of, he's the only artist out of this collection who has has kind of taken that form on. But more importantly is um, is the visual um, the the use of marquetry to um, illustrate the compl the kind of complicated um, um, discussion that he's trying to have here. Mm. But it's just it's very lovely and um, beautifully expressed. And it's striking to me the range, right? That this is a form that can take and make statements and use wood to talk about things as varied as um, some of these more sort of joyful, humorous moments, but also to, to really, you know, take on um, life as that's happening happening now, that sort of diversity of, of, of practice, I certainly, you know, from my experience going to see the show, that that vast scope is really well represented. Um, and and I think connects to the work that you're doing at the center more broadly. You know, I know that you joined the center 
three years ago and it's been a really busy and um, can't imagine it's been anything other than unexpected three years. Um, and I'm curious how, um, you know, the ways that you're thinking about moving the exhibition program, the artists that you want to be working with, um, what you think is possible for, for artists in wood to be saying, to be talking about, um, how that comes into the way that you're thinking about the center as it, as it, as it currently stands and, and, and into the future. I'm so glad you asked that question uh, because I think about this a lot. And um, first of all, I think it's important to note that despite the fact that I came into this field the very conventional ways through art history degree um, as bachelor's degree and then a master's degree. So, um, and, then, and then worked you know, in the course of, of studying for, in graduate school, I worked in an encyclopedic museum in the design department. So early on, my, my thinking about material culture and visual culture was shaped by a study of design. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that's how I developed an, a fondness and understanding and interest in constraints and how that shapes creativity. Um, but also I was, I was looking at, um, as I mentioned, object uh, directed works more than than images and, or experiential works and um, mm -hmm. and I think I'm still fascinated by the idea that uh, whether it's a work of design or a work of craft it comes with it a sense of familiarity and human scale that allows it to be powerful in a lot of other ways especially as a tool of subversion mm -hmm. so here we have an exhibition as a case in point where we have delightful, whimsical, joyful works on view. There's a lot of color, there's a lot of play. It's a context um, that's led by an idea that's very familiar to us We mm -hmm. and, and kind of cloaked in nostalgia as well. Most of us, if we've played croquet, we've done it you know, in our youth or as, um, as adults spending time outside with our friends and family. Um, so we have very, fond associations with it. And, and that offers a kind of leading point or a talking point that sucks you in a little bit more. And when you learn a little bit more about what these works are about, um, then you kind of can't get out of the discussion. Mm -hmm. And so um, I always use as an example, the work of Humera Abid, whose show was here at the center um, in early 2020. And um, that is another example of, of an artist who uses the beauty of the material that she carves in and her incredible technique and skillful facility with the material to compel you to look deeper. And then you are seduced into having a discussion or a confrontation that you really would otherwise not be comfortable having. Um, mm -hmm. I think art is the safe place to have these discussions and uh, we can learn among these, these inspired and innovated and imaginative works that were made by human beings who are thinking the same things we are. A safe place to have these conversations, but also a safe place to express joy and yeah. to find community in one another, which I think is those two polarities are really uh, present in the show and present in the collection. Um, mm -hmm. that, that the Center for Art and Wood holds. Can you tell us just a little bit about, about the scope of that? Excellent, thank you. Um, so the Center's collection actually extends beyond its history as an organization. Um, Albert Lekoff is with us. He's the founding director and the uh, executive director emeritus of the Center for Art and Wood. And this organization is not completely the seed of his dreaming and envisioning what the world needs, which is a unique space to be thinking about and learning about creativity in wood. Um, and as far as I know, this is the only one and in, only institution in the world with that kind of mission. So the collection now numbers over 1,200 um, objects and artworks that represent art, craft, and design in the material of wood or adjacent to the material of wood uh, and, its, and its attendant processes. Um, 
And um, we draw heavily in our programming, whether it's exhibitions or, or Zoom discussions, um, or our, sal our monthly salon series called Object Lesson, we, um, we continue to draw and activate the works um, in the collection because that's our, that's our mission and our anchor and the, dis the kind of framework for the discussion that we have um, through our exhibitions as well. And in this exhibition specifically, we pulled a number of works from the permanent collection to talk about discussions of play and play and subversion. So to further illustrate the point that I was making earlier about familiarity and nostalgia being really powerful tools, um, we put together some works from the collection, including um, Mark Sperry's Rejects from the Bat Factory, which play with function and kind of trick or, or manipulate the user or the player in this case. Um, and, um, and so from the whimsical side, again, to deeply hurtful and political works like um, the work of, oh, now I'm forgetting his name, Ted Hunter, which, mm -hmm. is, um, which was made in, in 1991 and is a really painful but beautifully and compellingly rendered comment on the Gulf War and um, the way that we're raising children in society and the way that children are impacted mm -hmm. by these political events. So uh, we've got the whole range in there and it's wonderful to be able to put companion exhibitions drawing from the collection. It's, it, it's a testament to the fact that uh, presenting something in a new context gives it new relevance. And certainly we're so glad that you've done that with Eshrick's work within the context of this exhibition. Um, I want to make sure that we have time for folks to ask questions that they'd like. You can either put a question in the chat or unmute yourself and ask. We have a small enough group here today that I think we can manage that. Um, but, but before we head into that, I just want to say thank you so much to, to Nava for sharing her time and her expertise. And um, I'll encourage everyone to go have fun, see this exhibition. Um, there is even a chance to play croquet in the galleries, which I, I think is, is rare. So <laughs> um, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of open it up to, to questions um, that we might have. Thank you, Emily. And thank you so much for being a partner in this show. Having um, Mr. Escherich's work in this show really deepens this conversation and grounds it um, and, and helps our visitors think more directly about our region and the master woodworkers and artists that were so important in building this field internationally and regionally. Don't be shy. It's just croquet. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, Hi, Nishay. What? Why croquet, of all things? Well, that's a good question. Um, croquet mallets and balls are traditionally made out of wood. Um, I mentioned earlier that there isn't a lot of discussion or research or writing dedicated to the material side of croquet mallets and balls or the game itself. And um, from, from early on, it was, it was a wood, um, it was a game that was about wood. And um, that sound that's so satisfying to make when you smack a mallet against the ball, which is actually more conventionally resin and not wood because the after much impact, wood doesn't necessarily hold up. So the balls are tenderly made in resin, but um, that, there's nothing like that sound. It is so satisfying. Um, and, um, and the woods that were used were generally, you know, hardwoods like hickory or lingam vitae, um, woods that would hold up under a lot of impact. And um, so that's why croquet nache. <laughs> yes, because the thing, when I think about games and I think about wood, I honestly think of like chess sets and checker sets before I think of croquet, just because um, like croquet to me is a game that people play when they have outside space. Yeah. Because I grew up in North Philly and I grew up in the row home, we didn't have a lot of outside space for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I think of like chess and checker sets. Cro the even I mean I knew croquet existed but actually thinking about it and knowing how it's played is something that's new to me so it's just 
I was just curious about the thought behind it, just because it's honestly, I don't remember a time before this show that I actively thought about croquet, just because it's not something that is part of my experience. So sure. that's where that question is. That's understandable. I, I'll say there, as a note of um, history, when croquet was first introduced to the US in the late um, 19th century, it was viewed as um, a social pastime that could be played in public spaces. So when you had public park designers such as the Olmsted brothers, they always dedicated a section of the park to um, the play of croquet. And then visitors to the park could, like in a library, they could take out a set um, and play with it and then return it to the park administrators when they were done. And so it wasn't until the post war period in the 50s when, when sort of social life in America as a whole retreated from the urban centers and, and kind of took up root in, um, in suburban backyards that these kinds of spaces became privatized and lawn sports were, were also taking place in private environments. So you, you had a retreat from these more public spaces. And that was really unfortunate, I think, because I love the idea that you could go to the Central Park or, or um, you know, any park in any urban area and take a set of your own or check out a set and play with, you know, even play a pickup game of croquet. Um, that sounds really fun, actually. <laughs> it, it would be, be really fun. I'm going to bring it back. You know, Nache, that's how you end up with people like me, where croquet is not a part of my sort of social, and I, my primary association is Alice in Wonderland, right? Is, yeah, um, definitely. Uh, I will uh, share, though, we'll, in the follow-up email, we'll link to a couple of Eshrick's uh, chess sets, though, if you want to see some really, really special um, approaches to game design in wood, that might be fun to, to look at and think about and compare um, with, with the croquet oh, that, that, that are sounds, on display. That sounds really fun. And like, I'm currently still working on research um, for projects, for upcoming projects, this is answered, but that makes me think of another, yet another project I can go on. Because <laughs> as Nava knows, I tend to dive down rabbit holes and go wherever <laughs> my uh, questions take me. So <laughs> we will, we maybe Nava can connect us. We'll do our best to provide you with the information to jump down a, a deep rabbit hole to keep it in the Alice in Wonderland vein. <laughs> Ooh, fun. I'm in. <laughs> We have, we probably have time for about one more question. Is there any, anyone else who, who has something that they would like to ask of Nava while she's here with us? Oh, we have one. We do. Hi, Donald. <laughs> we had Donald. Oh, he disappeared. Maybe he was waving goodbye. Okay. <laughs> well, if, if no one else has a question, I'll ask you one more before, before we head off, Nava. Mm -hmm. um, what's most exciting to you right now? Could be today in, in your work. Maybe it's an object you recently acquired or an exhibition you're working on, an artist you've just discovered. Leave us with uh, some sense of, of where next after, after croquet. Oh, there are so many things, Emily, and um, it makes me, as the years roll on, it makes me so excited to be here um, in my job. And um, I mentioned, I think I mentioned to you earlier, we have another exhibition here at the center that looks at contemporary jewelry and the material mm -hmm. of wood. And um, this is a really exciting conversation and um, and it needs expansion. So looking ahead will be, um, hopefully finding a way to develop a publication that talks about this field and, um, and the, the amazing opportunity and the amazing ways that artists are um, thinking about the human body and adornment in um, making works that are wearable and also um, making use of, the, of woodworking techniques and the material of wood. Um, looking ahead, the center is, um, home to an ambitious project that will 
launch in the end of 2022 that brings Cairo wood turning in the form of Islamic architecture and an element called the Mashabah into Philadelphia. So we'll be linking two cities that perhaps never would have collided in the past through traditions of wood turning and uh, wood turned architecture. So you'll have to come to find out more and um, join us for a chance to actually make, participate in the making of a Mashabia um, next winter. We will make sure that um, folks folks on in Wem's family know about all of those things. And I am already thinking about how we can book you for subsequent conversations. I hope again that folks have a chance to go and see this wonderful exhibition. And I want to thank you again, Nava, for, for spending this time this afternoon with us. Um, I'll ask me one of the things we love to do is is just unmute, say goodbye as you head out. So we have that nice little bit of connection <laughs> as, as folks head off into their day. But I want to thank you all for, for joining us today. And hopefully we will see you again at a future program. Thanks, everyone. Wonderful talk. Oh, thank you. Okay.